Well, what we want to talk about this morning, well, this morning is gone, this afternoon is, uh, is about the doubting prophet. And uh, this, this message is, is more of a practical nature, so I'm not going to get into doctrinal aspects. Part of the theme for this camp is, is what? Does anyone know? You're looking at your programs. Okay, that's good. It's, it is in your programs. Press toward the mark. And one of the things that hinder us in our spirit, spiritual walk from pressing toward the mark, from getting to our destination, one of the biggest hindrances is what we want to talk about today. So this is going to be a, a bit of a heart-searching, practical type of message. We're going to look at a story of a particular person in the scriptures that we don't talk often about, who had an experience that I think most of us, if not all of us, can actually relate to. And it's a very common and very serious problem that we face as Christians. And it's a problem that we don't talk about often enough either. Anyway, we'll see how we go. And the story uh, that we want to talk about actually comes from the book of Psalms. And Psalm 73 is where we're going to spend some time. If you have your Bibles, you want to follow in your Bibles, we're going to be spending a fair amount of time in, in Psalm 73. Or if you'd like to uh, look at the screen, the verses will be on the screen as well. Psalm 73 tells us that it is a psalm of Asaph. Truly God is good to Israel, even to such as are of a clean heart. Now the introduction to this psalm tells us that it's actually written by Asaph. Asaph, or some people say Asaph, but it's, anyway, whatever, however you want to say it, he wrote a number of psalms, this being the first one in this particular section uh, of the divisions of uh, the book of psalm, uh, Psalms. And uh, this man was actually no mean uh, character. He was one of the lead singers in the choir. He composed some of these psalms. And we know that these psalms are actually composed under inspiration. As a matter of fact, he has quite an uh, interesting description. If you turn over in your Bibles, or I have it here, in 2 Chronicles 29 and verse 30, this is what we're told about this man, Asaph, what category he's in. Moreover, Hezekiah the king and the princes commanded the Levites to sing praise unto the Lord with the words of David and of Asaph the seer. And they sang praises with gladness, and they bowed their heads and... Worship. So Asaph is actually a prophet. The word seer in the scriptures also means prophet. So this is a psalm written by this prophet, written under inspiration. And this prophet uh, conveys to us a testimony of victory that he had over, over a particular problem that we're going to find out uh, as we go along. The problem was quite severe because he actually nearly apostatized from the faith. He nearly lost his faith. This is a prophet of God that we read the Psalms of. And these uh, people in Israel used to sing the Psalms that were written by him. Quite a, uh, quite a remarkable thing to say that about a prophet, right? Well, we'll see what, uh, what this painful temptation was and also how he was delivered from it, which is the key point that we want to look at as well, uh, how it can relate to us. This struggle that he has is common, like I said, to all of us. It's something that you and I go through from time to time. Well, let's go and we'll, get, we'll go through that chapter, Psalm 73. And he begins there, we just read that, Truly God is good to Israel, even to such as are of a clean heart. It's kind of an abrupt start. It's actually the conclusion of his testimony. This is why he starts with. We're going to see how he got to that as we go through the chapter. But this abrupt start actually uh, portrays a trust in God. And this is what actually this man was struggling with as, uh, as we go along. And this is how he starts. Uh, obviously, he is writing this psalm after his experience, after the event has transpired, after this testimony that he shares. It occupies the rest of the chapter. And he's writing after that. And with the introduction of it, this is what he says. Truly, God is good to Israel, even to such as are of a clean heart. The next verse, verse 2, tells us, But as for me, my feet were almost gone. My steps had well nigh slipped. Interesting. Coming from a prophet. What would cause a prophet of God to say, Listen, in my experience, I nearly stumbled and fell. Obviously, he's talking here about a spiritual fall. He's talking about his, his connection with God. There is something that happened to this man that caused him to almost lose faith completely. And this psalm is the story about that. Now, uh, 
if I were to ask you a question, when was the last time you felt that way? Don't put your hand up, okay? I just want you to, to think between you and yourself. Uh, and you'll see that this is actually a very important practical issue that we all face from time to time. What would cause a prophet to almost give up the faith and go into apostasy? He tells us, next verse, verse 3. For I was envious at the foolish when I saw the prosperity of the wicked. <coughs> Interesting. He looked around, and it doesn't take you long to observe in this world, that things sometimes don't add up. And this happened to him when he looked at the wicked. He looked at the unbelievers. That's who the wicked are, right? The foolish and the wicked are the unbelievers, those who don't believe in God. He looked at them and something troubled him because he saw that they were, they were prospering. Whether they be prospering in wealth or in health or in business or in whatever it is, they were prospering. They were doing really well. And this caused him to actually feel envious, which implies that he wasn't doing as well. And it troubled him. It was actually nearly the cause of him slipping and falling, he said. Now, uh, <coughs> when was the last time you looked around and you wondered about the same thing? Don't tell me, okay? If you've lived in this world any length of time, you immediately start to notice, hold on a minute, that, that's an issue. That is true. This is what this man actually struggled with. And, uh, and he was envious, as he says. They were prospering. Not only were they prospering, prospering in uh, you know, uh, material things or, 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 or health or wellness, but they seemed to be happy and doing well. That's part of prosperity, right? No trouble in their life. Maybe they're even living up the life and having a great time doing it. And they are wicked and they are far from God and unbelievers. He goes on to say, verse 4, For there are no bands in their death, but their strength is firm. So they live a life of prosperity all the way till, till death. And in death there are no bands, no, no restraints. It's like they live it up till they die. They're strong till their last day. That's what he's saying, right? Have you observed that that actually happens in the world? Uh, is, is that something you've noticed? On planet Earth, yeah, welcome to planet Earth, right? This is, this is what happens. This is a, a, common, a common situation. And uh, it's something that as believers, as Christians, causes us to wonder at times. I know that because here is a prophet of God, and he was wondering about that. And he wasn't just, it wasn't a passing thought. It occupied his mind so much, it nearly caused him to lose faith. So it's a serious matter. And so these people live, they die, and uh, they seem to be really doing well. Asaph was not the only one who struggled with this thing. This was a common theme. This is why I'm saying, I know that most, if not all of us, can relate to what he's saying, this experience he's going through. Job, for example, wondered about the same thing, exactly. Job 21, verse 7 and 13. Wherefore do the wicked live, become old, yea, are mighty in power? They spend their days in wealth, and in a moment go down to the grave. Job was wondering about the same thing. He's not the only one. Jeremiah as well, chapter 12, verse 1. Righteous art thou, O Lord, when, when I plead with thee, yet let me talk with thee of thy judgments. Wherefore doth the way of the wicked prosper? Wherefore are all, the are all they happy that deal very treacherously? Here's Jeremiah has an opportunity to bring up some kind of a question. Something he wants to inquire of God. Something he wants to talk to God about. Something that's obviously on his mind that troubles him. Of all the questions that he asks, this one, he says, Lord, this does not make sense. Why is this this way? You ever wondered about that? Have you looked at a brother or sister? Well, maybe it's not a brother or a sister. Have you ever looked at such and such a person who is not a brother or a sister, and they're doing so well? And here you are, 
Christian Bible believing you doing nowhere near as well in whatever category money health uh, you know family whatever it is you ever wondered about that I am sure I am sure you have here are faithful men of God who are also wondering about that and actually troubled go we go back to Psalm 73 verse 5 he goes on he says they are not in trouble as other men neither are they plagued like other men who are these other men that he's talking about the believers huh the other men who, who believe in God who seem to be having a really rough time a really hard time here are these wicked in contrast and they are seemingly to all intents and purposes all appearances they are doing well they're prospering to the day that they die good men <coughs> seem to have trouble men and women okay when I say men gender inclusive in this day and age just so <laughs> just so we are clear uh, these people don't struggle like we do they seem to, ha to have everything they need and even more besides now brothers and sisters I want to tell you something this is one of these topics that we don't usually talk about much right we don't even voice some of these things, as we shall see, he'll tell us a little later. And yet, this is one, actually, cause of a severe, severe trial to many people. To many people. Especially when the believer is going through a hard time. You might be going through a hard time right now, as a believer, in whatever circumstance in your life. And you look around at other people who might not share the same faith, who might not even believe in God at all. And, and you think, man, they don't have anywhere near as, any trouble as I do. Lord, this does not make sense. This does not seem fair. These are the questions that come in, in our mind, uh, in the private places in our minds. And the devil is there to make sure that these questions, you know, cause us to start to doubt and end up almost like this brother here, SF, end up losing faith altogether he goes on verses 6 to 8 therefore pride compasses them ab about as a chain violence covereth them as a garment their eyes stand out with fatness they have more than heart could wish they are corrupt and speak wickedly concerning oppression they speak loftily well, that's what ends up happening right pride ambition and eventually being oppressive not caring about others. This is the case with the wicked who prosper. As a matter of fact, if you want to prosper in this world, sometimes you have to be proud, ambitious, ambitious, and not mind stepping on others. That's how you get ahead. That's how you take care of number one. Well, these people do just that. And here is poor Asaf observing that, and he's troubled. They have everything and more. Look at the car they drive. Look at the house they live in. Look at the job that they have. Look at the family relations even that they might have. And here am I, a believer, and look what I'm driving. Maybe I don't even have a car. Look where I live. Look what's happening. And we compare, we do this automatically. Sometimes it just happens automatically. And we compare, and it does not add up in our minds. Isn't that right? Does not add up. It definitely didn't add up with SF. And of course, as a result of that, these people, because they seem to be doing so well, they become proud, haughty, what we would call full of themselves, right? Pride is one of the things that God especially actually hates. And so we look at these people and think, God does not like pride. Look at how proud this person is. And yet they seem to be so blessed with all these things that make them prosperous. And I'm the believer and I wouldn't mind some of these blessings, you know. Lord, wh what's going on here? Jeremiah asked God just that question. That's why I'm saying it's a serious matter. It's a matter that actually can affect our walk a great deal. How we can make sense of some of these things. Have you ever thought that way? If you have, you're not the only one. Asaph thought that way. He goes on, verse 9. They set their mouth against the heavens and their tongue walketh through the earth. 
You know, he talks about their, their mouth against the heavens. What does that mean? Try and speak to one of these people about God. What do they do? They will mock you to your face, some of them, right? Sometimes maybe it's, uh, when it's a bit closer to home, right? With some family members who might not believe. You know, from talking to people uh, in different places we visit, some of the hardest people to reach are probably your family members. You try and talk to them about some of your peculiar, weird, and odd beliefs and practices, right? They don't take you seriously. They might even laugh and mock you. Well, these people, this is how they respond. They speak against God. They disdain and mock God and religion and faith and people of faith. This is how it is with these wicked who are prospering. And it's a puzzling thing. It's a very puzzling thing. Some of them might, might even outright deny God altogether. They don't need God or religion or faith, they might say. So they speak with their mouth against heaven. And their tongue walks through the earth. What does that mean? Their tongue walks through the earth. The, their speech, what they have to say, carries influence with others in the world. And here you are trying to share the truth with someone, nobody's listening to you. And they just have to say something, maybe because they're rich and famous, and everybody tunes in to listen to what they have to say. And Asaf is looking at this thinking, Lord, what's, that, what's going on here? This doesn't add up. Or, you know, if we're holding a camp, right? We're sharing the truth of the camp. Look, you know, all of us are here, that's great, but, oh, we'd love to have more. You know, if somebody rich and famous and, and uh, considered high, uh, prosperous in this world were to hold an event, People would flock to the event to listen to what they would have to say. This is, what, this, is bro this is what's brought out here in this verse. Influential. Not only are they prosperous, but they're influential. And their influence does not work in God's favor. What a puzzling thing. Verse 10 and 11. Therefore his people return hither, and waters of a full cup are wrung out to them. And they say, how doth God know and is there knowledge in the Most High? Just may I, let me explain to you verse 10 because there's different ways to translate verse 10. But what, what it's saying simply is, as a result of their influence, even God's people can be affected and be drawn away from God. Like emptying a cup. That's, that's what verse 10 is talking about. And people are led to think, how does God know? There's no knowledge in the Most High because it doesn't add up. It does not look fair to us. Their influence can not only keep people away from God, but they can actually, as a result of that situation, end up causing a faithful person to turn away from God. And Asaph almost was one of these people. So that's why I don't need to ask for a show of hands here to put your hand up, and uh, maybe you might not want to put your hand up, if you've struggled with that, or if you've thought that way, or if this is an issue that has troubled you. If you've lived in this world any length of time, I guarantee the devil's troubled you with this particular thought. Because this is very quickly observable in the world that we live in. And so he concludes his observations in verse 12. He says, Behold, these are the ungodly who prosper in the world. They increase in riches. They're doing really well. Not only that, but they keep getting richer. You know the saying, right? The rich get richer and the poor get poorer. Okay, so this is what, he, this is what he's observing. He says they're already rich, they have more than they could ask for. And yet they keep getting richer and richer. More and more. Like I said, I think we can all relate to what's going on here. And it causes, it's, it's calls for us to really reflect upon ourselves and to examine our hearts. This is really what the point of what I want to share uh, with you today here is. Uh, that's what the point of it is. Uh, and this observation that he made, made him ask a very, very interesting question. It's a question that no doubt would come up as a result of such, you know, observation. He asks it in verse 13. This is what he concludes. He says, Verily, I have cleansed my heart in vain and washed my hands in innocency. What's he saying here? What's the point of being a Christian? That's what he's saying, right? What good is it? 
In vain I've cleansed my heart. You know, I was naive and innocent trying to be pure and, and holy and a worshiper and a believer in God. I think I was taken for a fool. Because look at what these people who don't believe in God are like. That's what he's saying. How many times have you wondered that? And uh, if you're honest with yourself, you must have wondered that in your Christian walk as a believer. There is no doubt about it because there is a devil in the world. Because this happens in the world. And we're humans. We're more or less like each other. We're made from the same stuff, give or take. But we're the same human brothers and sisters. And this man was struggling. He, he basically was saying, it doesn't seem to me like there is an advantage to serving God. That's what he's saying. You know, sometimes it feels like th this way in our Christian walk. And the amazing thing, as we'll see as we go along, the amazing thing is we generally don't express such a thought or such a sentiment because it is totally outrageous. It is totally unchristian to think this way, right? So if I was to express it to a brother and sister, I would seem like I am not really a good, strong believer, and I don't want to give that impression. So we keep our mouth shut. Right? You know what I'm talking about, right? Don't answer. Just, you know, I just want you to think. I just want you to think. Because brothers and sisters, we have to be honest with ourselves. We have to be real, right? You know, that's the saying in the world, keeping it real. You have to be real. And this is a very real and serious part of our Christian walk. There are people who pretend to be Christian when in heart and in reality they are not because some of these things. You do realize that? Some people give up the pretense altogether and they say, I'm going to walk away from it all. It's a real thing. And so, this is his conclusion, that his religious devotion to God, his hearing of the law, his keeping of the law, his service in the sanctuary. And this was no mean character, right? This was a prophet of God. This was a lead singer in the choir, in the sanctuary, singing and writing psalms. And so if you're in the church and, and you have an active role, you are not immune from this problem. This is, this is the caliber of men we're dealing with here. He's not the only one that wondered that. We actually, we actually have this same thought expressed in Malachi chapter 3, verses 14 and 15. Here's how this prophet expresses it. God says, God is revealing that this is a thinking process among his people. This is God speaking. He says, You have said, It is vain to serve God. And what profit is it that we have kept his ordinance and that we have walked mournfully before the Lord of hosts? And now we call the proud happy. Yea, they that work wickedness are set up. Yea, they that tempt God are even delivered. This was how God's people sometimes felt. And God is saying to Malachi, I know this is what you people are thinking like. I know that this is what's happening. You think this way. So, sometimes it might seem to you that you are worshiping God. And all you get is trouble. And here is someone who is not even a worshiper of God. And they don't get any trouble like you do. That happens, right? And obviously you would start to think, what is the point? Or what benefit do I get? What's in it for me to be a worshiper of God? I might as well not be worshiping God. I might do better than how I am doing now. This is what Asaph was struggling with. And this is the struggle that many times we can face and that we can feel. If you've ever felt that way, if you've ever thought that way in the private chambers of your mind, you're not the only one. Here's what he says back in Psalm 73, verse 14. For all the day long have I been plagued and chastened every morning. Here is the contrast. Not only are the wicked doing well and prospering, here I am. A prophet of God. And it seems to me like all day long I am plagued and chastened every morning. Can you relate to that in your Christian walk? Lord, I'm having trouble. It's a hard time. You know, I am certain that you are having some difficulty and trial at this point in your life. 
in some area, in some department. There is a devil whose job it is to make sure that he does that to you and me. And this is what it feels like sometimes. It might be a health problem. It might be a financial problem. You might have just lost your job. You might have just lost your house. Maybe it's a family problem. Whatever the issue is, there is struggles and trials that we go through. And this temptation is especially difficult and hard when we are going through a hard time. Isn't that right? We, all of a sudden, the mind starts thinking, why is this happening? And then we see Brother Jones there. Or not brother, sorry. He's not a brother. He's a wicked person. An unbeliever. Mr. Jones there or Mr. Whoever. And man, it doesn't add up. Now the Bible tells us, of course, that no chastening seems to be a joyous thing. It's not fun to go through trouble. I don't need to tell you that. The Bible doesn't even need to tell us that. But God says that. He knows. In other words, He knows. He's well acquainted with how things are. And yet, we seem to have that. Why? And when these questions come up, it becomes a real struggle, brothers and sisters. A real struggle. It actually makes the difficulty and the trial so much worse many times. And then there's another problem attached to that as well. He says it. Verse 15. If I say, I will speak thus, behold, I should offend against the generation of thy children. What's he saying here? And if I was to express this, I will stumble my brothers and sisters. And I can't really express it. So this trial and this struggle goes on in your mind, in your heart, and you're all alone going through this puzzling trial. And, you can, and sometimes, maybe most times, we can make no sense of these situations, you know that? They make absolutely no sense to us. They don't add up. And of course, like I mentioned before, you know, you can't go to this brother or sister and tell her, look, you know, these guys, they, they, they have everything and I don't and, and, and I wish I did. Who does that, right? <laughs> when was the last time you did that? And especially if they're wicked, right? Because we're Christian, because we know this is not how we should speak. This is the speaking doubt, right? You're not supposed to speak doubt. We're told that. And it's true, you're not supposed to speak doubt. But some, sometimes, brothers and sisters, we have to be honest with ourselves. This is a real problem, a very real problem. It's actually a very prevalent problem. I, I don't need to remind you how many uh, cases there are in the world of the wicked who seem to be prospering. So what can happen. Well, thankfully, this is, a, this is a testimony where this brother got, got the victory over this, this particular struggle. And it's written for our learning. It's written for our encouragement. It's written to help us. It's written to remind us of an important thing and how we can deal with it. But I just want to emphasize how real it is. The description, you know, we can all relate to that. The description is so, so real. And so, now I'm not advocating, don't get me wrong here, I'm not advocating that if you think this way, you should go and tell others and introduce them to this line of thinking. And then you have a whole church uh, with people in that problem. But it is something that we must acknowledge that exists. You know, sometimes the way people deal with this is they tell a person, oh, don't think that way. You're a Christian, you're a believer, you shouldn't think that way. If, if it's expressed, right? Maybe you said that to someone, maybe someone said that to you, right? And so we, we learn very quickly, we don't talk about this stuff. We don't express this type of stuff. But what happens is it sits there. It needs to be resolved, brothers and sisters. Sometimes it sits there and it festers and it grows and it ends up in people actually abandoning God and still going through the motions of what it is to be a believer. That's one of the saddest and most tragic situations to be in. This was so troubling for him. This is what he says. When I thought to know this, verse 16 and 17, when I thought to know this, it was too painful for me. Until I went into the sanctuary of God, then understood I their end. Amen. So here's the turnaround in this, in this chapter. But I wanted to put those two verses together. The two contrasts. He basically admitted human defeat as far as figuring this thing out. That's what he's saying, right? 
When I sat and I thought and I pondered about all this to try and make some sense of it, I thought to know this, to figure it out, to resolve it, and it was too painful for me. It was beyond me. The more I thought about it, the more painful it got. The more I saw this person or the more I heard some news about such and such person, the more painful it became for me. As I look at my own struggle, my own circumstance, what I'm going through, what I'm experiencing, and trying to figure out how this makes any sense, how, how God doesn't seem to be even hearing me, is God seeing what I'm going through? Can't He see that this is very difficult for me? It doesn't make sense, right? Until something happened. It says, until I went into the sanctuary of God, then I understood their end. What that simply tells us basically is this. You can't humanly reason out some of these things. They do not make sense. That's what he's saying, right? Until something else happens. This turning point, you know, I, I think of it as he expresses it there. It's like one day he was at church, okay, the equivalent today. One day he went to the sanctuary. One day he went to church and something hit him, right? One day something hit him and the rest of the chapter is actually pretty good. We'll see that. Uh, and there was a turnaround. Coming into the presence of God did something in resolving this issue in the mind of SF. And it's interesting. It's interesting that we would know nothing at all about this circumstance unless this man had written down this testimony. The people who s sat next to him in, the, in church or who, s who sang with him in the choir probably had no clue about the painful struggle that he's going through in his mind. We know because he wrote it down. And that's many times how it is with us, right? You know, we might, we might sit there or go to church and we might appear as very good, strong, believing Christians. And we think, boy, if, this, if, if people only knew what's, what I'm struggling with. And this occurred to this man. He says he understood something. He understood their end. What does that mean? He wasn't looking at their end before. Even though he said, you know, they live well until they die. There's no bands in their death. They die strong. But here he understood an end that had not occurred to him. That he had missed. That he had not maybe thought of or neglected to think of. This, it hit him one day. Coming into God's presence did that for him. He understood their end. And they, the, the thing is, human reasoning alone is not enough to resolve this problem. You need divine enlightenment coming into the presence of God and what God reminded him of. The Apostle Paul expresses that very well. And uh, what Asaph needed was a change of perspective and viewpoint. And that's what happened. Paul expresses it well. It's in 2 Corinthians. We're familiar with this text. But I want to remind you of it because we all re need reminding of this precious truth. 2 Corinthians 4, 17 and 18. For our light affliction, which is but for a moment, worketh for us a far more exceeding and eternal weight of glory. While we look not at the things which are seen, but at the things which are not seen. For the things which are seen are temporal, but the things which are not seen are eternal. When Asaph came into the presence of God, this reality, this truth hit him because he had forgotten, he had neglected. Somehow it missed his attention. And all he could see was what he observed with his eyes, what he heard with his ears, and that became too much for him. In God's presence, he saw the bigger picture, the picture of reality. But the picture of reality has a, a part of it that is not physically visible to our eyes. As a matter of fact, that, we are told, is what is real and eternal, while the things that are seen are temporal or temporary, right? Just, they are just passing. In other words, what we see with our senses, what we observe, is not the end of the story. There is more to the story that we do not see, that divine revelation communicates to us. But because we are human and because we live by our senses, we are prone to 
conclude things based only on our senses. And we lose sight of the reality of eternal things. And when we do that, because of all these things that happen around us, because maybe we go through a hard time, because maybe we go through a trial, we can fall for this temptation of doubt and actually end up poisoning our Christian walk. If not altogether, losing our Christian walk. It's a real thing. And so this is why I'm saying we need to be reminded of that. You know, it's interesting when Paul here says, for our light affliction. You know, some of us might say, well, Paul, you don't know what I'm going through. <laughs> right? And look, I know so some of us, so I know there are some people who have some very serious and very severe struggles. You know, I've heard stories and people share things that are very, very heartbreaking. They're believers. And inevitably, sometimes when these stories are shared, when these, you know, personal trials are shared, sometimes it's expressed or sometimes it's implied. A wondering of why doesn't make sense. For example, why doesn't the Lord heal me? Why doesn't the Lord give me a job? Why doesn't the Lord do this? Why doesn't the Lord do that? Don't I worship God? And it's, it's what this man was expressing in that very song. And what it is, brothers and sisters, many times, it's because the real world, the world we, we, we feel through our senses, to us, we start to think this is all there is to the story. Even though we're believers, even though we know, we know better, right? Because our mind sometimes just thinks as a human mind. We just conclude the human conclusion. Now, I'm not trying to make light here of anyone's struggle. But it's the Apostle Paul who says that our affliction is light. And the reason he says that is not because he's comparing it to someone else's affliction that is worse. And you know, sometimes, sometimes we feel better about our problem when someone else has a worse problem. That's, that's human nature, right? Paul is not saying our affliction is light because here's someone else who has a worse affliction, so you shouldn't be too, thinking too hard of yourself because you have it better off than others. That's not his reasoning, right? His reason is, listen, there is, a bigger, there is a bigger reality. He's reminding us of the things that are not seen, not other people's struggles, other people's trials. He's saying, listen, these things that are seen, they are temporal, they are temporary. It's only passing. That's why your affliction, my affliction now, compared to the great length of reality and eternity, it is a light thing. Look on that. That's what he's saying. Keep your eyes focused on that because it's the devil's job to keep our eyes away from that. And that is the source of this trial. This is the source of this dilemma and this temptation and this tragedy that has taken many people by the wayside. Many Christians. You might be struggling with this very point sitting here today. I don't know. But it's a real thing. It's a very real thing. So, I want to uh, encourage you. I want to remind you, brothers and sisters, if you are struggling with that, if you are having a, a, a hard time, remember... The things that are seen are temporal. The things that are not seen, they are eternal. And to get a reminder, to get a fresh perspective of the things that are not seen, you need to come into God's presence. Just like this man went into the sanctuary, then it hit him one day. And you know when that happens? Sometimes the difficulty of the situation that you're in might continue to be exactly the same thing. But all of a sudden, because your attitude is different, the whole thing takes on a different perspective. Isn't that right? It's just a change of perspective, a change of viewpoint. View things from God's perspective, there is a very different outlook. There is a greater reality, there is an end. View things from a human perspective, you will not be able to resolve this dilemma, guaranteed. And that's the source of the trouble and of the difficulty. And look, I know we all go through hard time. There's a beautiful comforting uh, passage. I don't have it here, but it's in the Spirit of Prophecy. And uh, it tells us something to this effect. I'll paraphrase it. You might recognize it. It says, one day in heaven. You know, this earth says we go through puzzling, very puzzling, trying experiences that make no sense to us. And they might not make any sense to us while we continue to stay here on earth. But one day in heaven, 
We'll walk with the Lord. He'll take us by hand and He will explain to us the dark and mysterious chapters of our experience that made absolutely no sense to us. And then we will see things in a way that will make sense to us. You familiar with that? Yeah. I'm sorry I can't quote it, but okay, some of you say that you're familiar. You've, you've read that, right? And the thing is, brothers and sisters, it's to learn here, now, to trust in that. God does not necessarily explain everything to us now. He just says, trust me. I can see what's going on. I can see that this does cause a struggle. I know all of that. But remember, the things that are seen are temporal. The things that are not seen, they are eternal. And when you compare your experience with the length of eternity and how things will be in eternity, it will be nothing but a light affliction. This is what happened to this man. And this is what the Apostle Paul is reminding us of. And this is what I want to remind you and me of. Because it's a real thing. Back to Psalm 73. He goes on, verse 18. Surely, so he says he understood their end, right? This is what he says now. Surely thou didst set them in slippery places. Thou castest them down into destruction. How are they brought into desolation as in a moment? They are utterly consumed with terrors. As a dream when one awaketh, so, O Lord, when thou wakest, thou shalt despise their image. He sees something that he didn't see before about the case of the wicked. And usually that's the case. When we look at how someone else is doing well, we usually see all the good points, all the prosperity that they're going through. Sometimes they do have issues and struggles, but we, don't, we might not observe that, or it might kind of fade in comparison with all the prosperity that they have. So that's all we notice. And here the prophet gains a divine insight and he starts seeing things in their perspective and he sees that the end of the wicked is desolation it's not prosperity he sees that there is a God in heaven who is a righteous just judge who sees and knows more than you and me in observing all these seeming irregularities and unfair circumstance that we see in life So, don't mistake the dream for the full story. It says here, O Lord, when thou awakest, thou shalt despise their image. You know, our time on this earth is like a dream that eternity will be the wake up from. You realize that? <laughs> you know, if, if you're having one of these nightmares or a horror dream, you know sometimes you dream and you know you're dreaming? And so that helps you, because if it's really bad, you know it's only a dream. Or at least that happens with me sometimes, okay? I don't know how everybody dreams. But you know what I'm talking about, some of you? Yeah. Yeah. And you wake up from it. Okay, this life, brothers and sisters, is like a dream. God will one day, it says, wake up. Not that God is sleeping, but He will bring in reality. The eternal reality. What we're living in here now is this probationary, temporal time. That God is saying, listen, there is a bigger story. You're my children. You're in this world. And, and Jesus told us, you know, in this world you will have what? Tribulation. Tribulation, right? It's the devil's world. The devil is the God of this world. That's what I mean. And as such, the devil's number one job is to give you, a worshiper of the true God, a very hard time. And to give the wicked a very great time. And to make sure you observe the great time that they're having so you can have a worse trouble than you're having. That's his job. And you know what? You have to remember, you know, someone put it really well. They said, uh, this earth is the only heaven that some people will ever experience. Yeah. This sin-cursed earth, this messed up world with all these problems, to some people will be the only heaven they ever experience. And to some people, this earth will be the only hell that they will ever experience. You, you know what that means? Have you figured it out? To the wicked, this is as good as it gets. When eternity hits, that's the end of the story. And this is what he's describing. It will be the end. There is no living it up for the wicked in eternity. So here is a lifetime of how many years? 70, 80, 100 years? A little bit more than the three score and ten. Okay, let's say it's 100 years. And that's it. Can you compare that with eternity? So if you're having a hard time, this is probably the closest you will get to as a believer. To the, 
to the experience that it's commonly referred to as hell. Okay, hell in the Bible is referring to the grave. I'm using the, the wrong uh, understanding of it that seems to be more prevalent. You know what I'm talking about, right? Uh, just so nobody thinks I believe <laughs> something or other about hell. But that's, that's the thing, brothers and sisters. How is your perspective, our perspective, how we view things, how we read things, how we interpret things affects our walk and our connection with God. If you look, and look, two people can look at the exact same situation, but looking from a different perspective, they can draw different conclusions. The facts haven't changed. Your attitude, your viewpoint is either human only or is either enlightened with divine understanding. Just like Paul said, and that's what we need to remember. And I know this is hard for us sometimes because only the six senses is what we're used to in order to process information. The, the sense of faith does not often come naturally to us. It's something that we have to train ourselves to trust God, to look with faith, and sometimes even allow that to override our senses when it comes to making a judgment about a situation. That's what caused this man to struggle, and this is what we need to be reminded of. Verse, seven, uh, sorry, verse 21, he goes on. Notice what, when this realization hit him, notice how he felt now. Thus my heart was grieved, and I was pricked in my reins. So foolish was I, and ignorant. I was as a beast before thee. What's he saying? I felt stupid. In English, okay? And this hit me. It's like, Lord, Lord this, what happened to this man? He says, Lord, I lost sight of the things that are not seen. All I, all I went by was the things that I'm seeing day in and day out. And they had an effect on me so profound that I nearly lost my faith. I questioned God. Things didn't make sense. And I wanted to just throw the towel in and walk away. That's what he said. My feet nearly slipped. And then when he came into the presence of God one day and reality hit him, somehow God awoke him in his mind to the reality of the bigger picture he understood there and then he realizes, Lord, I'm so sorry. I'm, I was so stupid. That's true. I know all that. That's what he's saying. You know, I'm here telling you, I'm not telling you any some remarkable thing or something new you've never heard before. We all know that. And yet we struggle with that, right? Because we forget. Our eyes wander. Our spiritual eyes wander. We just conclude based on our senses. And it causes us a severe trial that hinders us from pressing toward the mark. That's what we want, right? I don't need to ask you, do we want to press toward the mark? We all do. The fact that you're here today says that. This is one of the things, brothers and sisters, that hinder us because we look on the things that are seen and we put a lot of stock in the things that are seen. So here he is, he's feeling grieved, pricked, foolish and ignorant. He's feeling like an animal. You know, an animal that only goes by their instincts, their senses. He says, sorry, Lord, this is how I felt. And you know, sometimes <laughs> our struggle is uh, not only from, from, uh, from the wicked. Sometimes, especially when you believe something different, like we believe the Father and the Son message and, and the truth about God, right? Have you tried to share that with people sometimes and you find the experience frustrating, trying, hard, Maybe even you're persecuted because of your faith. Maybe the church kicked you out. Maybe they even gave you a hard trial and then kicked you out and treated you so unfairly and so on and so forth. And you have the truth, right? You can show from the Bible that Jesus is the only begotten Son of God and that there is one God. They say, Lord, why is this happening to me? And you know, some people go through a very hard time because of standing for the truth. So it's, it's real, brothers and sisters. It's very, very real. Remember, that's not the end of the story. That's what this man remembered. And now he begins to speak very differently. His tone changes, right? Something happened and his tone changes. Verse 23, Nevertheless, I am continually with thee. Thou hast holden me by my right hand. Amen. Isn't that a powerful statement of faith? He doesn't say, well, thank you, Lord. Now you've given me riches. Now, now I'm going to follow you. The, the situation hasn't changed. What changed was something in him. And now he speaks in light of the perspective he has gained from coming in touch with the divine 
presence in the sanctuary. So he speaks this statement of faith. He says, I'm continuing with thee, thou hast holden me by my right hand. Interesting, notice something. He did not allow his doubt and his thinking to cause him to feel that he now cannot express faith or that God has rejected him. You know, the things he said earlier are pretty serious. We would not classify them as statements of faith, right? They're statements, sorry, statements of doubt. But now he realized something, and he comes to God, and he accepts God, and in faith holds his hand in God's hand. He says, you're, you're, well, God holds his hand. He recognizes that. And this is the thing, brothers and sisters, another component to this trial is, sometimes we go through an experience like that, and we try and come back, and this is what the devil says. You think you can come back and be a Christian after you were thinking that way? Isn't that right? He uses the hard time against us to prevent us from coming back. And we think, yeah, you know, as a Christian, I should never think this way. Maybe God doesn't accept me, maybe. And we just keep thinking the same way. Don't allow that to happen, brothers and sisters. If you've ever wondered about what this man wondered about, he, you're not the only one, obviously. There is nothing wrong with asking or wondering these questions. What is wrong is if you continue to remain there and choose to ignore the reality. You with me? Yeah. And so if you've struggled with that, you, you, you've found that difficult, I want to encourage you. There is a bigger story. And don't let the fact that you struggled with it prevent you from being a man and a woman of faith like this brother was. Verse 23, he goes on. Uh, no, sorry. Uh, this is not verse 23. Uh, this is an encouraging verse in light of what I just said. Psalm 37, verse 23 and 24. He says, The steps of a good man are ordered by the Lord, and he delighteth in his way. Though he fall, he shall not be utterly cast down, for the Lord upholdeth him with his hand. That's something encouraging to remember, brothers and sisters. The steps of a good man are ordered by the Lord. And this good man sometimes may fall. But even though he fall, the Lord does not cast him away. He upholds him. We see that in the story of Asaph. Just want to encourage you with. He sustains him, he upholds him with his right hand, with his hand. Uh, God knows we think this way. God knows this is a real struggle. Remember that. Remember God's upholding hand. Remember that even though you might stumble and you may even fall as a Christian, that's not the end of the story. There is a way back. You know, the Bible says it. We know that we know the verses. If we confess our sins, he's what? Faithful, Faithful and just. Be do you believe that promise? Yeah. Then believe that God fulfills that and accepts us. So if this was something that you personally have had, don't forget about God's upholding hand. Here he goes on. Now back to Psalm 73, now verse 24. Thou shalt guide me with thy counsel and afterward receive me to glory. Amen. Did this man have an assurance of salvation? It kind of sounds like it, right? He definitely did. Despite this trial that he went through. You will guide me in this earth with your counsel. And then afterward, the eternity, the things that are not seen, you will receive me into glory. Now he understands his end. And in light of that, and in view of that, he is able to come to terms with the circumstance, the trying circumstance that he might be going through in this life. God wants to guide us, brothers and sisters, with his counsel and receive us into glory. And then he concludes the psalm with these words. He says, whom, verse 25, Whom have I in heaven but thee? And there is none upon earth that I desire beside thee. My flesh and my heart faileth, but God is the strength of my heart and my portion forever. For lo, they that are far from thee shall perish. Thou hast destroyed all them that go a-whoring from thee. But it is good for me to draw near to God. I have put my trust in the Lord, in the Lord God, that I may declare all thy works. And then this is how the psalm actually starts. You go back to verse 1, you understand why he started the psalm this way. He says, surely God is good. Brothers and sisters, we need to draw nigh to God. We lose sight of God sometimes in this world. 
for whatever reason. It does happen. If you're one of those Christians that that never happens to you, great, God bless you for it. If you're like some of us, it does happen. So I want to encourage you. I want to remind you, draw nigh to God. Trust in God. Don't forget that there is an eternity beyond. God knows and keeps a record of every little thing and every big thing that we experience. And His promise is one of these days, you know, by the river of life, you will have a one-on-one -on -one meeting with Jesus. And you'll be able to ask all these puzzling questions that you might never get an answer to in this earth. But we can trust in that promise. And that can sustain us. And be like this man and express our faith in such words and therefore in such behavior and practice as Christians. So, next time you struggle with this issue, remember to read Psalm 73. It was written for you. God impressed this man to write a song about this. They actually sang this. They would sing this in church. They would sing about the wicked prospering and how it doesn't seem fair. And they would finish the song by saying we trust in God because we know there is a greater end. I pray that this will be something that you will take to heart, that it might encourage you in your experience, in your difficulty, in your trial, whatever it might be, so that you can continue to press forward and press toward the mark. Let's kneel if you are able and we'll close with a word of prayer.